Hello again, dear friends. Welcome back to part two of Shot Flow with me, Paddy Bird, uh, founder of Inside the Edit. We're the industry's leading creative editing course and in partnership with our friends over at Adobe. So if you haven't already, go and check out part one where we talked about the fundamental principles around Shot Flow. Very, very important part of the initial stages of what we do on the timeline as editors how we piece these shots together we're looking at shot shot we're looking at shot flow but shot flow is made up of things like continuity frame size changes action um, that happens over the cut uh, the fluidity of the camera movement whether you allow it to stop and start um, when you're starting and ending your shots and things like that so um we looked at a sequence in part one, which was it was a kind of very easy sequence to understand. We just looking at um, what was going on in the shot, the different shots, size changes. There was, I think, one or two shots in there that was had some camera movement in when we cut in and when we cut out to create that kind of fluidity, that nice visual grammar that we have that audiences love and is essential. If we get this wrong, they're just going to switch over. Um, so we really have to pay attention to this. Now, for part two, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a slightly more complicated sequence, um, which has it's a bit got a lot more action, got a lot more camera uh, movement um, and things like zooms in and stuff like that. So we're looking at the over, we want to look at the overall shot flow of this, but how it's broken down and what we're looking for over each cut and how we're piecing these together. A really good way to think about shot flow. Uh, indeed, to think about the nature of what goes on in our timeline when we're building these early stages in assembly is like a kind of grid. So what we teach at Inside the Edit is that, you know, you've got a, you've got a kind of two-dimensional grid here. So there's things that we need to be concerned about. Going this way, on the horizontal plane is shot flow. So how are these shots being cut together to tell the overall pictorial narrative, the arc of the particular scene? And then you've got concerns around the vertical as well. So this two dimensional grid, the vertical is, is very much to do with how these shots are linked together with what's going on in the dialogue. But that's for another masterclass. Um, so we're deeply concerned with the sequential nature of how these shots are cut together. Yeah. So think about it like a grid. You've got your timeline on this axis. You're looking at shot flow. The playhead goes like that. We're looking at shot flow on this axis. We've got the connectivity between the shots and the dialogue, the sync, as we call it. Um, so obviously that's for another masterclass. What we're going to be doing today is, is focusing a lot more on these, on the uh, horizontal plane. Um, so let's look at this sequence. It's, what is it, about two minutes. It is from the documentary, uh, one of the films that we teach at Inside the Edit. It's about California photographer um, Anthony Epps. Uh, and this particular scene is, is, is quite a tense one because it's right before he's a photographer and we follow him for a couple of years across different countries and he is basically this is the morning of his exhibition he's been planning this exhibition and shooting it put all his life savings into it you know it's a big moment um so he's he's pretty nervous um and it's the morning the early in the morning of this so this is many many years of hard work leading to this moment so Let's watch this sequence. Here we go. This is different. This is completely new for me, this kind of exposure. The most I've ever had to see a show has got to be 200 people, maybe 300 over a month. I keep thinking, 
yeah, my panels are gonna be in St. Packer Station. And it's gonna look good, it's gonna look great, and I'm gonna see it finally up and done. But I haven't really thought about it. There's gonna be thousands of people seeing it too. And I'm gonna be looking at their faces, you know, and watching their reactions. Thousands of people are gonna see my work before 9 a.m. What's the worst thing that could happen? I don't wanna talk about worst things that could happen. I'm a pessimist. I'm not an optimist. Now, the worst thing that can happen is I, I show up at 7.30 and there's nothing there. I'm not nervous. Nothing to be nervous about. It's fine, it's gonna be fine. Let's just do this and be happy. It's like a dream, it doesn't exist until I see it. Okay, so an interesting little sequence that we've got there. We've had, uh, you know, we've got an obvious uh, chain of events. So there's a sequential nature to the sequence. Tony gets up. He gets ready, he, you know, puts his clothes on, he makes some coffee, he starts looking at a few things, he gradually gets dressed, and then he goes out of the door, gets in the cab, and then goes driving to the exhibition at St Pancras Station in London. So there's a sequential picture arc, there's a sequential nature to the picture arc. It's very, very kind of obvious what's going on there. But when we're looking at the camera work, What's particularly fascinating here is that we can see how all of these individual shots, like a jigsaw puzzle, are cut together. Now, if we're looking at this horizontal plane like a grid, you know, like the timeline, the grid, how we're cutting these shots together. Let's think about the things that we, we looked at in part one of this masterclass, which was the camera movement. Obviously, there's a lot more of that in this sequence. The shot size changes. Um which are going in and out quite regularly. Um, and we've also got continuity uh, as well, which is a part of shot flow. But also here we've we've got the added um, aspect of zooms. There's quite a lot of zooming in and out and stuff like that. So the fluidity of the logic in between these shot sizes and stuff like that um, can be really well defined in a term that we call it inside the edit, the reverse domino theory. So. Let me just uh, go full screen for this. What is the reverse domino theory? Well, the reverse domino theory is, is if you've ever played dominoes, the whole object of dominoes is you've got a tile with two numbers split in half, and the object of the game is to go five to five, and then two to two, so that you connect them all together when you've got your go to go uh, to to connect them in this with the same number. So the reverse domino theory is a really nice way to think about shot size changes So the um, when you're cutting things together. Obviously, you can break the rules and people do and stuff like that all the time. But this is a great place to start. On average, a large percentage of sequences are made up of differing shot size changes as we move around wide to medium to close. So you can see why we call it the reverse domino theory. You want to match a two with a five or a three with a one. Yeah. Now, how fast you jump from extreme close up to extreme wide is a different kind of thing. We don't want to be concerned. To, we don't want to be overly um, uh, kind of intense with the massive amounts of movement that we asking the viewer to, to uh, you know, go through in, in when we when watching a sequence. But essentially, this is a good rule of thumb. Think about when you're piecing images together, especially of a sequential nature of moving in and out, around, up and down, 
um, the shot sizes. That's a really good way. So we've got this, these two concepts which we're going to look at uh, in detail, which is the reverse domino theory and the idea of the horizontal grid. How are these shots linked together? Now, let's go a bit deeper now. Let's, gonna st let's just really start to do some, some deep level of analysis here is what makes these, these kind of work um when shot together and what we're going to do is we're going to analyze this sequence and look at what's working um and why and then in part three i'm going to do a live cut so i'm going to take some raw footage and i'm actually going to cut this stuff together and talk through what i'm thinking at each moment and seeing if these shots cut together so let's do this analysis first and then in part three we'll do a live cut and uh, specifically paying attention to shot flow so here we go. We've got a nice big establishing shot of London at this time in the morning. It's a high angle shot, quite cinematic. That's nice. So that stands on its own. That's what we would call an illustrative shot. Shots can be defined really, uh, most of the shots can be defined by, is it a singular image that's illustrating a person, place or thing? Or is it a sequential shot? So is it illustrative? Or is it sequential? And that's a really good question to ask ourselves because the sequential shot is B-roll that's usually been, or actuality, that's usually been shot as part of a chain of events. So a camera operator will go in and follow something or someone or an object or over a course of a period of time and they will break down the action that happens. Could be 30 seconds, like making a cup of coffee, or it could be two hours and then we'll break it down into different shot sizes. So that's a really nice understanding of how that helps us with shot flow. Illustrative, singular images, like this shot here. Uh, it's not part of a chain of anything. It's just a singular image that is illustrating a time and a place and a location. London, 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., whatever it is, um, dawn. Uh, or or uh, sequential, and you're going to see some sequential stuff here. We've got this this sequence is mostly sequential, so that's a nice shot there. How are we going from here to here? Okay, so we've got a static shot. Tony's turned on the light. He's sleeping in his office, and we just have a nice little bit of um, yawning there. He's turned on his light. Okay, another static shot. We're seeing the time. So it's just after, it's just coming up to 20 past six in the morning. Again, these two shots are nice. Wider shot, what's going on? They're static. There's no, there's no, there's no movement around there over, over here. So we've got a wider shot and we've got a close up. Remember the reverse domino theory. That's nice. This is different. This okay, is then we've got cut back to him. It's a slightly uh, lower angle shot once he's got up. But it's a kind of mid shot, isn't it? It's a mid shot. So we've gone from close to mid. You know, a mid shot is like cutting him off at the waist. You know, these these are kind of interchangeable and television does it slightly different from film. And, you know, it's all a bit, you know, it's all a bit different in terms of the terminology, but that's roughly what we're doing. So let's go from there and look at what we're doing. Is there any action or movement in here? That's minimal. Is it go over the cut? Not really. Exposure. Okay, so we've cut straight here. There's a compression of time in between these two. Now, the audience will swallow that. They will be totally fine with that. That's not a problem. Um, as long as there's logic in the shot flow, and there is. So we've gone from a mid shot to a wide shot. So we could see this concept of the reverse domino theory really at play here. Uh, again, again, we haven't seen any, any movement so far, but it's definitely coming. He's turning on this light. Awesome. Ever had. And then bang, we're over. We're we're gone from a wide shot again. We've gone over to now to another mid shot, and he's getting his coffee out. Ever had to see a show? It's gotta be two hundred. And again, we've gone from mid shot. We've gone into a close up. He's doing more details of you know. So I'm looking at the movement here. I'm looking at the movement now. Look at the hand position there. So the arm position. If you play that 10 times over by yourself, you'll think that's a continuity error. We can get away with it absolutely fine. Uh, it's not a massive continuity error like he's changed the color of his shirt or he's put a hat on. Slight changes in movement in a fast-moving sequential sequence are swallowed by the, the, um, 
you know they're really accepted by the viewer so don't to worry about that too much because there's a, it's a question of what else is going on that's similar within the in the outgoing shot and the incoming shot if, it, if a predominant amount of it is similar 60 70 80 percent and there's not a massive change in someone's frame or whatever you know hat on color of the shirt which is a massive continuity error the audiences will be fine with it but you can see again we've got some 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 really nice uh, reverse domino theory here it's gotta be 200 people maybe 300 and now we've got a first piece of movement so we started off on a close and then people. we've got a nice sort of tilt down for tilt and pan down to tony putting the coffee in now what's the essential action that's going on there now this was really interesting let's just play this i let the coffee i could have cut out there so when the essential action of the shot had ended which was plonk the camera movement had ended and the action in the frame had, had ended but i chose to actually take it a bit more and and there's a second kind of ending to the shot over a because it, it was a, it was a, uh, it was turned over and then he put the spoon, the coffee spoon back in the coffee jar, which I thought was nice. So there's a number of things going on there. I'm letting the action finish and then I'm cutting out. If you do it, if you start cutting out halfway in the action and there's nothing in the next shot that relates to this shot, that's when you get bad shot flow. So let it finish, let it finish, let it breathe, bang, out then you can go to cut to another shot cutting around essential action and not in let not letting um action or camera movement finish at this fundamental elementary stage is going to cause bad shot flow that's a very big thing to to um to notice right let's carry on so we've gone from a close with a bit of movement down action has ended over a month and we're back out here for a mid shot over a month. where tony's um getting his coffee mug again so we've got another we've jumped forward in time but it's fine as a compre you know we're in a compressive art form editing is a compressive art form we're compressing time it's not a problem um and the the mug's gone down so there's a logic to it i've waited till the small bit of action has finished and then i've cut to this nice close-up shot so we've gone again from a mid to a close-up shot the action is progressing over time across different shot sizes and if you'll notice as well just a nice bit of music theory here there's a nice little doom in the music and i timed that with the water being flowed uh, with the water being poured so that's uh that's a nice little bit of symmetry and connection there uh, and there's a slight bit of movement here as well let's look at that as we as the camera sort of slightly reveals the bottom of the uh the coffee pot thing so that's nice so we've we're seeing reverse domino theory in full swing here again ah now this is interesting because we've gone from close up to close up but there's a fundamental like this is out of focus um because it's got that cinematic bokeh look we're focusing on the on the on the f uh, background action not the foreground uh, elements but then we come in and zoom out now there's a connectivity here which is really nice so there we go we didn't come in on the zoom out we established a shot for it, like probably a half a second first then we let the zoom out finish we've got a connectivity here with his hands on his face and then we've got the towel on his face so that's a really nice connection for me in terms of shot flow it gels and glues one shot to another because it's similar is it the same no the hands yes but this time on the second shot there's a towel so we've gone from this is a sort of halfway in between a sort of mid and a close i'd say it's more of a mid and we're on to a sort of mid here because we had a zoom in so it was a close there then it's more of a mid and then we're on a sort of mid close there um so there's a connectivity you could see there's no messiness around the car i haven't cut in or out when there's camera movement or anything like that um in in a messy way i keep thinking yeah my panels are gonna be in st packer station now this is really nice this is the obvious end 
of a little part of this sequence. Sequences are usually made up of mini sequences inside a lot of times. So I've let him walk out. Look at that. He's walking off and I've let the character walk out of frame. So it's kind of the end of that mini location by the sink. And now I've cut in here. So he's getting his it's gonna look glasses out of his desk. Good, it's gonna look great. And we've got we've got a number of different things going on here, yeah, which are really, really good. interesting. So it's I've cut to the shot to establish what is going on here. Anthony Epps photography, this is a draw, but he's going for the glasses. I've left it a beat, and let's look at the outgoing shot. Always check your outgoing shot to your incoming shot. Check for your camera movement, check for your um frame size changes say ch check for your you know reverse domino theory and check if there's any um zooms or anything like that so we're pretty safe here i've established this what the eyes probably drawn to that first and then this second you know it's a toss-up between those two and we got a lot of things going on in here so look at this shot we cut to it it's gonna look good. we've got it's action look coming in we've got the character's action coming in and right at the same time we got to zoom out and then a pan and tilt up. So there's like three or four things going on at the same time. That's fine to have in. Absolutely fine to have in. But you have to make sure that where you come into the shot, it's, you know, luckily all the things are happening in a very short space of time over about a second and a half, you know. We need to have that cleanliness. So we've cut in before all that stuff happens, establish the shot, then have the movement, then have the zoom out, then have the tilt over, then have the action, all that kind of stuff. So you can see that there's a fluidity across those cuts that work really, really nicely. And I'm going to see it. Okay, he's put on his glasses and then the coffee's ready. So I'm letting the action finish here. Look at that. He's put on his glasses and he's put his hand down to the computer. The action's over. I can now go off and do what I want. Up. and there's a compression of time there is the audience going to be fine with that of course they are it's going to be absolutely fine done. mid shot again but wide shot pouring this. thousands of people close up pouring milk you know this is all sequential action this is all very very good you know so we can see we can really really see you know what's going on here in the logic about how we're moving across um a sequence with frame size changes with camera movement with zooms and with action that's playing out across that from characters and objects so let's just finish this sequence now because i've explained to you a whole bunch of stuff so this time watch the sequence we'll watch it full screen but this time watch it and look at it through those three or four different principles that we've we've looked at it's really really um, handy to look at the outgoing and incoming shot what the shot size what the camera is what the movement is what the zooms are and what the overall sequential nature of the arc is um, because if we ha if we can practice this and practice this and practice this all of our sequences have this fluidity to the shot flow this this visual grammar across the whole sequence which is which is really really nice so yeah, let's go back and watch this sequence. And just keep in mind exactly what we talked about. We'll go in and we'll, we'll, we'll pay attention to those four or five different things. But look at reverse, particularly reverse domino theory for this. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. This is different. This is completely new for me, this kind of exposure. The most I've ever had to see a show has got to be 200 people, maybe 300 over a month. I keep thinking, yeah, my panels are going to be in St. Packard Station. And it's going to look good. It's going to look great. And I'm going to see it finally up and done. I hadn't really thought about this. Gonna be thousands of people seeing it too, and I'm gonna be looking at their faces, you know, and watching their reactions. If 
thousands of people are going to have seen my work before 9 a.m. What's the worst thing that could happen? I don't want to talk about worst things that could happen. I'm a pessimist. I'm not an optimist. Now, the worst thing that can happen is I, I show up at 7.30 and there's nothing there. I'm not nervous. Nothing to be nervous about. It's fine. It's going to be fine. Let's just do this and be happy. It's like a dream. It doesn't exist until I see it. Okay. So, we can see all of that shot flow at work. Uh, and when we've got our eye on that and we're sifting through our footage to decide where the best in point is where the best out point is and how these shots are, are cut together these are major factors in the theory that needs to be buzzing around in our head at that time so uh, i hope you really enjoyed that uh, some some really interesting um creative editing theory there join me for part three and i will go through it in real time we're going to take a bunch of footage Raw footage on the timeline, I'm going to cut it live and I'm going to talk through what I'm thinking about the movement, the shot sizes, how they're all cutting together, the zooms, the action that plays out in front of the camera and how on a vertical, sorry, a horizontal plane across my timeline, how this is going to manifest itself in terms of our visual arc, our pictorial arc over the course of the scene or sequence that we're, that we're actually cutting. So um, please come and join me for part three very soon. Take care.